Welcome to today's Harvard Business Review, How I Did It Live, featuring Brad Smith, the President and CEO of Intuit. I'm Angela Heron, the Editor for Special Projects and Research at HBR, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today, both those of you who are in our web audience worldwide and those of you who are here with us in the Steelcase work-life space in very snowy New York. We really want this to be an interactive discussion today, so for those of you on the web, if you have a question at any time, just click on that question icon and send in your comments. We'll have a Q&A period at the end where we'll be feeding in those questions along with the questions from those of you here in our audience. We also have a conversation going on on Twitter. You can find us at HBR Exchange and use the hashtag HowIDidItLive. Now let me turn the program over to Adi Ignatius, the Editor-in-Chief of HBR. Okay, thanks, Angela, and I want to thank everybody for coming today, for brave, braving the weather. Uh, I want to thank Steelcase for, uh, for hosting us here today. And I'm here with Brad Smith, who, uh, uh, you know, in addition to everything he does at Intuit, has written a piece for us in our uh, January-February issue, uh, a, a print version of how I did it, that talks about uh, how uh, in, Intuit particularly uh, adapt, has adapted design thinking into what they're doing. So we want to talk about that. But I want to start with a really easy one for you, okay? okay? Tax season is coming up. Yes. I have an accountant. I pay him a lot of money to do my taxes. That's insane, right? Well, Adi, first of all, thanks for having me, and thank you all for coming out in the weather. This is the second time we scheduled the event and the second time we've had snow, so you know I'm a good luck charm when it comes to the winter. But, Adi, we love CPAs. In fact, we sell software to accountants who do taxes as well, but we're also big fans of people that are self-empowered who can do, the, and do taxes themselves. So TurboTax is one of our best-known brands. And for those who are capable of doing more than they sometimes give themselves credit for, there are 30 million people who file their taxes with TurboTax, and many times they do it for free. So we are all about the self-empowered as well as the CPA. All right. So I want to come back to that. I want to come back to that okay. product in a second. But, but let's, let's talk about little sets of context. So, so, you know, when you became CEO of the company, uh, 2008, give a little sense of what the company was then and, and how it's evolved, just to kind of set things up. Yeah, happy to do so. First of all, I had the benefit of inheriting an incredibly strong company. When I became CEO, I'd been in the company five years, and in 2008, we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And those that came before me are well known in the Harvard Business Review. Scott Cook, the founder, Bill Campbell, the chairman, Steve Bennett from GE, and just really strong leaders. And so I had a very solid foundation. But when we looked at what was happening around us, we were in the early stages of a significant platform shift. In fact, today, many people say this is the most significant platform shift we've seen since DOS to Windows. At that time, a new device was coming out called an iPhone. You had a Facebook phenomenon kicking in, which was driving social. You had the world's borders coming down. And so what we recognized is that we were a strong company that needed to reinvent itself. And to do that, we were going to have to move from a desktop software company to a company that was going to embrace connected services and really lean into social, mobile, and global. So we went through a reinvention process. We call it the next chapter of great. Uh, so keep going. So that, that, yeah. that's a challenge. So you have a, a successful company, but you're trying to reinvent it from a position of strength. Yes. How do you do that? How do Because I think a lot of companies essentially face that dilemma all the time. How, you know, what are your... What are your what did you learn? How do you sort of roll that out successfully? Well, I had the benefit of a, a transition that lasted six months. So my predecessor said, okay, we're going to make the transition in January, take the next six months, and basically go into a learning tour. And so I went out and I met with our top shareholders, I met with our board members, and I met with our employees, and I asked them three questions. When you look at Intuit, what are the single biggest opportunities that you feel are untapped, that you just don't understand why Intuit hasn't done anything about it up to this point? The second is, what are the biggest risks on the horizon that you think Intuit is not thinking enough about, that if we don't address them, we could really have a problem? And the third is, what's the single biggest thing I could do to screw this up? Mm -hmm. And what I got back were tremendous consistencies and patterns. Is you're a desktop company, it's taking you once a year to get a new product out, but now, with the, so the social environment and with the web, you've got to be able to get products out every day. And so we needed to reimagine our innovation process. So we had to be able to innovate daily. The second thing we recognized is that we were going to have to change our technology. You know, it couldn't be Windows-based platform anymore. We needed to design for mobile. And so we needed to bring new talent in and teach our existing talent how to design for mobile. So it was basically the next chapter of skills we needed to be able to compete effectively. So how long did it take to kind of, you know, get the company to where, where you wanted it to be and to bring the staff along where they really felt like, yeah, this is, we're okay, this is... Yeah. Well, there's no finish line, so I can't <laughs> tell you we're sitting here today and say, we're done. 
we're not because the, the thing keeps moving on us, but we really got traction pretty quickly. What we did is I took the job in January. In April, we had a company-wide broadcast, the first time we had actually done that since Scott Cook cut, shut the company down in the early days to write the values. So there was this moment in time when Scott actually shut the company down and took 500 employees off-site and they wrote the values together. We hadn't done anything like that until I was in this job. And we unveiled a new brand. Um, so the logo that Scott had had for 25 years, which was a very proud logo, it had the head with the little whizzy bang things in it, which I think was Scott's head because his IQ is incredible. <laughs> Since I was stepping into the job, I wasn't going to be able to live up to that. So we changed the logo, and if you look at it, um, into it is the company that dots the T's and not the I's. And everyone says, well, why do you dot the T's and not the I's? If you look at the logo, the T's look like people. And in between the two T's are the letters U and I. And what we were moving to is a connected services world where it's people helping people, and in between those people are you and I. And so we got on that journey quickly, and it galvanized the team. The second thing we did is immediately, in that first 100 days, we adopted unstructured time. That is 10% time where our employees can work on any project they want that they think will solve a customer problem. We borrowed it from Google, and it's really based on the premise of we don't believe in the genius and a thousand helpers. Uh, we actually believe that the best ideas should emerge, and the way to do that is through experimentation. And so we unleashed unstructured time, and immediately we moved into lots of experiments, and that, that fueled growth. We got $100 million in revenue from products that I didn't actually prioritize in the first two years. I, I'm interested in that. So, so I've been out to Google, and I guess they, they give yes. people 20% sort of unstructured time. Yeah. And they come up with ideas, and they, you know, stand in line and sort of present, here's what I'm thinking for 10 minutes to uh, whoever's in charge. How do you do it? So people come up with ideas, and then what's the, what's the process for filtering out good workable ones from the, from the rest? Well, that's something that we ended up editing as a result of meeting with Google, and they shared with us that if you looked at their track record of success, it wasn't always the ones that were selected by the management team. It was the ones that were posted up on Google Labs. And then you saw who was getting the most downloads and where the customer feedback was the most positive, and you let the market choose. So we avoided the whole thumbs up and thumbs down because I knew I wasn't going to be the one who could pick the next great thing, but the market could. And so what we started to do is we taught the lean startup experimentation process where every team has a hypothesis. It's a team no bigger than two pizzas can feed. They run a rapid experiment with the roughest prototype possible, and then if they actually validate that it exceeds their hypothesis, they come in and we fund it. I have a fund called the CEO Fund. It's like venture capital money, and I will give them money for 90 days, and they run the next experiment. And so we ultimately fund successful experiments, and the team shut down the ones that aren't successful because they're intellectually honest. If it didn't achieve their hypothesis, they don't want to go show their boss, look, I did something and it didn't work. And so they literally self, self assess. Yeah. Are there any examples of something that, that came from the bottom up that you've adopted? We have quite a few. A great example is the ability to do your taxes on your mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we first went out with Social Mobile and Global, I talked to our team in TurboTax, and I'd been the general manager there, so there was a whole lot of familiarity with me. And I said, look, we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with this computer in the palm of our hand. And one of the engineers um, used a very familiar, you know, what the hell does a mobile phone have to do with taxes? Excuse my French. And I said, you know, I don't know that, but you're smarter than me and you'll figure it out. Well, sure enough, what they figured out how to do was to take a picture of all your tax documents using the phone's camera, having optical character recognition, actually read the data, and pre-fill your entire tax return, and your taxes can be done in less than 10 minutes. And that is now one of the most significant catalysts of grow driving our growth in TurboTax. Mm -hmm. And that came from an unstructured time experiment. Yeah. You talked before about trying to you know, instill or, or reinvent the sort of sense of values within the company and, and you know, even the yes. logo sort of has meaning. Can you talk about how that, you know, I understand externally, you, know, you want to create a logo and a, and, a, and a sense of purpose that where customers will trust you. But internally, how do you, how do you, you know, what, what is the purpose of the, the kind of value proposition? How do you make sure you really, people get it and that they're, they're living up to it. Yeah, well, really the logo was actually just, as you just said, it was, it was cosmetic. Uh, what was happening underneath the hood was we were refreshing our values. So Scott had gone out and shut the company down and the values had served us extremely well. What's amazing is for the first 10 years of the company's history, the values weren't written down, they were implicit. But everyone could see how the leaders role modeled and the decisions they made and ultimately one day they went to the hotel and they wrote them down. There had only been one word that had changed from the time Scott did that until I took the job. And then one of the things I started to do when I was on the listening tour was ask the employees to list our values. And there were 10, and the most anyone could list were six. 
And so we step back and we realize that some of them were no longer as contemporary. Even though the spirit was alive, the words didn't represent the diversity we felt. They weren't talking about sustainability and being environmentally friendly. And so we chartered employees to actually go in and look at our values, maintain the spirit, but update the words to be more reflective of who we are and who we want to be. And so that actually got the entire organization to say, this is the company we have been and the company we aspire to be, and we got it down to fewer values. Mm -hmm. And so the proposition is basically, we believe employees first, customers second, shareholders third. And I know that that's a great philosophical debate. How, do you, how are you a customer-focused company if employees are before customers? And our belief is if you have the most talented, engaged employees who care about customers, they will change customers' lives, and that will ring the cash register for shareholders. And so everything for us is about creating an environment where they run experiments, creating an environment where they help us define our values, and creating an environment where their ideas are more important than my ideas. Mm -hmm. So, what's a, so, so Scott Cook is still chairman, is that right? Uh, he's actually our founder. He's the chairman of the executive committee, not okay. the chairman of the board. Okay, got it. But he, so he's still present. I guess my question yes. is, you know, how do you, yeah. how do you, when you have a, you know, a powerful, uh, successful, you know, founder, executive chairman, still there, and you're president CEO, you know, how do you, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how, how do you do your job when there's this guy who kind of, you know, got it all set up, is still around? Well, I have a gift and my gift is Scott Cook, and my gift is Bill Campbell, and my gift is 8,000 employees that I honestly believe are much smarter than I'm ever going to be, so I learn every day. But there are two things that I learned early on in taking this job. First was humility. Seek to understand before seeking to be understood. And Scott has so much experience and so much wisdom, but Scott is also incredibly humble. Scott took himself out of the CEO job after 10 years in the job. He decided that he didn't get energy from the administration part of the job. He loved working with engineers and products. So he knew what he liked, and he knew where he didn't want to spend time. So right off the bat, there is no contention between who's the CEO, because he had already taken himself out 20 years before I took this job. And the second is, I'm so interested in hearing his thoughts that I try to be very inclusive. And then the second thing is role clarity. We're very clear with the organization. Scott and I sit down on a regular basis, and we say, where are the five to six areas where we need his help? and where he really has a lot of passion, and that's where he spends his time. Yeah. So I do want to ask before we Please. Uh, get off the topic about the, the tax fraud um, uh, you know, cases that I read about um, in the paper. I mean, you know, you're not the only ones who've been hit by that, but, right. but you're big and you've been hit hard. I guess m maybe you tell people briefly what happened, but, but kind of you know, how you've dealt with it and what you've learned from that. Yeah, happy to do so. I don't know if you've read in the press, but there is a systemic attack on the... Uh. I'm sure this is fine. This is all good. <laughs> so, yeah. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Just focus on the big and powerful Oz. <laughs> and it's going up again. This is really entertaining. I'm this enjoying is live, this. Man. That's this right. Is... You can't, you know what? The only thing that makes this better is if there were six inches of snow on the ground. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Right. So back to what's going on right now. There have been a lot of identities stolen across the globe, and in the U.S. in particular, you know, major retailers and healthcare companies. And so what's happening is people are using those identities and then attacking big sources of money. They're going after the American tax system. They're using people's social security numbers and their identifiable information, and they're trying to file tax returns on that person's behalf. Now, that person's not out of money, but they're out of the pain of someone having their identity from some other source, and then it takes them time to work through that with the government. And so as a company that does 60% of the nation's online tax returns, we were the first to see the enemy in 2012, and we began to work with the IRS to make sure that we were producing reports that would let them know of anything that looked suspicious while we were doing our best to keep them out of the product. Now that game has shifted aggressively towards the states, who don't always have the same resources as the federal government. And so our lessons learned are two. The first is when you are a cloud-based company, when you're any company, trust is the currency. The number one thing you have to have is integrity, and your customers have to know that you trust that it is their data, not yours, and you will do everything you can to protect it. So we have made sure that our customers are protected, not only with having the most leading security measures in our product, but we have hotlines and ways to help them. Even if they're a victim of fraud someplace else, they can call and we will help them. The second thing is we're seizing the opportunity, Adi. We are stepping up because this is a systemic issue. It takes the federal and state governments. It takes all of our competitors. And we're all going to have to implement a set of standards and best practices if we want the criminals out of the U.S. tax system. Last year, the IRS uh, predicts that they stopped about $24.5 billion worth of fraud, but they still paid out a little over $5 billion. 
and keep in mind, 70% of Americans, the biggest paycheck they get every year is their tax refund. So even if someone goes in and steals their tax refund, they'll get their money back, but it may take them four to six months to get that money back from the IRS, and that's just way too long for families that need it. So we are committed to this. I've written a letter to my peers in the industry and to the commissioner in the IRS. We're convening meetings in Washington in the next two weeks, and we're going to take this on systemically. I feel like everybody in the world except me gets a tax refund at tax time. Right. I always, I always have to write a big check because yeah. I haven't been withholding enough. Or Well, you know, you could use TurboTax. You may get a different outcome. <laughs> that was too easy. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, okay, so what you wrote about in the article for us is, you know, you talked about trying to make Intuit a design-driven company. And yes. So why don't we start, what, what was the problem you were trying to address uh, with that approach? Well, coming out of that transition phase, 2008, when we recognized we had a wonderful company that was in a model that was quickly shifting beneath our feet, we needed to speed up our innovation process. And so we took a look back at the last 10 years of new product development, and we had launched 54 products. Four of them had achieved at least $50 million in revenue. The others, quite frankly, had not been very successful at all. So we dug into the ashes, and we said, what are the learnings in here? What are the things that we can get underneath? And one of the things we realized is we've been optimizing for features, and we've been optimizing for ease. And one of the great quotes that I love is, you can make a sewing machine easier to use, but it doesn't mean I'm going to sew. You have to really step back and look at what the customer is trying to do, and you have to solve that customer problem. As Clay Christensen says, what is the job the customer is hiring your product to do? So when we decided we needed to become more design-driven, we realized that Ease and features are not the game plan. It is impact and emotion, much like the iPhone did for the mobile phone industry. Completely reimagined what a phone was capable of doing and made it so important that in the Great Recession, when people were asked, what are the five things you can't do without, the iPhone was actually at the top of the list next to microwave ovens and other things they needed to live. And that's what design-driven thinking does. So, so, so how, so, so keep going. So how would you, so you define design driven then as? Design driven for us, yeah. two components. First of all, it is not the realm of designers and engineers and product managers only. Yeah. Everyone in the company has a role to play in design driven thinking. Finance, HR, legal, every single corner of the company needs to be thinking design driven thinking. And I can talk about how you do that later. Sure. The second is we actually went through a pretty rigorous process to test what are the components of design-driven thinking. How do you create awesome design? It's got three core pieces. We call it the delight pyramid. At the base is nailing the customer benefit. Why did I hire this product? What is the job I wanted to do? The second is it has to have a breakthrough in ease, something that you could have never imagined was possible. I had no idea this thing was a computer and not a phone. I didn't realize I could have my family's pictures right here. I mean, all the things that the iPhone did. And then the last is you have to design emotion into your product. Now imagine in our company, when I first started to talk about that, I had people say, look, we do accounting and taxes. People don't have emotions about accounting and taxes. They just want to get them done. So I took them out to Amazon and read the reviews of our products. And you read a lot of emotion in those products. <laughs> and then my question was, is that the emotion we want to create? And if it's not, then we need to be thinking about what is the outcome we're solving for. Those three components, and you work with the teams to make sure they have a product vision that's very clear about the customer benefit, very clear how they're going to do this in a way that's transformational, 10x better than anybody else, and what is the specific emotion. And the emotion changes the tone, it changes the colors, it changes where you place the buttons. All that stuff leads to an emotional outcome. Yeah. So, so it's basically about user experience. It is more than a user experience in look and feel. It's also about the functionality of the product, the speed of the product. But yes, in total, yes, very holistically, it's about the user experience. Yeah. And can you talk about an example of something you were doing before that seemed to make perfect sense that, you know, then you realize that's not how people interact with it or, or yeah. That you well, since tax is that perfect topic we talk about, uh, you might imagine that we hire a lot of people who understand the tax code to help us make sure that TurboTax works at a federal and a state level. And when you step back and you started to read it, we had a lady, we do follow me homes every year, 10,000 hours of follow me homes. We're invited into your home or into your small business. We're not stalkers, we are invited. <laughs> and I was sitting with a lady um, and she was confused on a screen in TurboTax because one of the things it said is this cash or non-cash. Well, when you're in the financial services industry, people know, you know, cash is cash and non-cash are checks or credit cards or other things. And she got confused and she said, I'm not smart enough to use a software. 
And we said, why not? And she said, I don't know what cash and non-cash means. Mm -hmm. And so we realized and at that time what we did is we actually hired an editor from People Magazine to read all of our screens and say, how do we turn this into language that everybody would understand? And then since then, we've taken those lessons and we've built them in. So now our product, when you read it, it's pretty, uh, it's kind of whimsical. Hey, the government makes us do this. Don't freak out. We'll get you through this in a pain-free way. Just click OK, and then we'll get on to the next stuff. Or we'll say, what is your birthday? Because you have to ask for that in tax. And we say, hey, we're celebrating our 30th birthday this year, too. Into it was founded in. And so we kind of try to have a little give and take. And believe it or not, that changes how people feel about doing their taxes. Is there a balance? You know, at a certain level, do you need to be credible? We're oh, yeah. dealing with money. We're not yeah. goofing around here. I mean, how do you, how do you find that balance? It, it is right tone for the right topic mm -hmm. and the right moment of truth. There are moments where there is high risk, high reward. You don't want to be whimsical there. And there are moments where there is a tough task that gets completed, and you want to be very celebratory and reinforce that they're capable of doing it and just keep going. You're almost finished. Mm -hmm. And you've got to really be clear about what emotion you want to solve at what point. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so once you decide that's the path you're going to take, how do you, how do you then physically transform the company to, yeah. to be design-driven or to think this way? Well, this was the fun part, and I have to say, um, I was extremely nervous because I'm not an engineer by design, and I work with some of the most talented engineers in the valley. And I was afraid that I didn't know how to do this. So the first thing we did is we took my senior staff and we identified 17 companies in the valley that we admired who had great products, and we reached out to their CEOs, and each one of us took one and said, could we actually follow you for a day? And so I followed Marissa Meyer at Yahoo. And we were at Facebook, and we were at Jawbone, and all the companies you might imagine. And we went and we watched how they made decisions. We watched how they spent their time. We watched how they conducted product reviews. And then all of my leaders came back, including Scott. And then we all came back, and we put on a whiteboard what were the things that we saw that they did, and we started to circle the patterns. And then we said, we're going to begin to lead differently. And so that was the first thing we did, is we looked at how leaders led. And I can tell you the big aha we got. A leader's job is not to put greatness into someone. It's to create the environment where that greatness already exists and it simply emerges. So how do you create the environment where the smartest people who are closest to the customer can do the work? That was one big aha. The second thing we did is people were worried about whether they would recognize what an awesome product experience was. So we asked everybody to come to the next staff meeting and on one piece of paper, describe for us their favorite product in their personal life and tell us why you're excited about it. And I can tell you, we heard about everything from wine openers to the seats in somebody's car that actually has a lumbar relaxing, and they're like explaining it like this. And it was amazing. And we had our CFO stand up, and he was hyperventilating at the end as he was describing his product. And as he was describing his product, Scott and I were at the whiteboard, and we were actually writing down, it's a word cloud. We'd write down the key phrases. And what was amazing were, you would hear everything about, it did exactly what I thought, but it did it better. And at the end of the day, I was so excited, I ran in and told my husband or wife this. It ended up being benefit, ease, and emotion. And so what we did is we unpacked the delight pyramid, and everyone then recognized they knew what it felt like, and they knew how to, re to recognize it, and so we turned it into a formula that we could go teach, which was the delight pyramid. Yeah. Okay, so, so you talked about the need to create an environment where this kind of you know, thinking yeah. happens and is recognized. So that sounds like it's partly a... Uh, um, you know, a kind of a, a, you know, a leadership exercise to make it clear that, that you know, we're welcoming. But, it, but also probably a physical challenge. How do, you, how do you put people together? How do you, you know, what kind of interaction you want to have? Uh, groups of people, spontaneous. I mean, is there a, a, a physical, geographical kind of solution here as well? Oh, absolutely. In fact, as a part of this whole process over the last seven years, we've been re remodeling all of our facilities. Um, you might imagine as a 30-year company, you start to have furniture and cubes that start to look like the prior generation. And so we've opened up much more creative workspaces. We have collaborative spaces. We have rooms where teams get together. They call them their hackathon rooms. Um, and all of that led to a lot more sort of organic creativity that was started to happen. We launched a tool called Brainstorm because we're an 8,000-person company that's across a lot of countries. And so instead of physically being located, someone could have an idea that they wanted to work on, and then a designer from another part of the company could opt in, and they could virtually collaborate, and if they all had the same passion. And so people kind of went with their passion, and that just unleashed all the kind of design thinking that we were looking for. Mm -hmm. there's a, I, this is reminding me of there's a Harvard Business School professor who I think is a consultant as well who talks about Apple. 
Yes. And you talk about Apple, and everyone's like, wow, yeah, they're amazing. They're just one of a kind. They're the best. They're the best. And at the end of it, he says, well, imagine if Apple took over your company, what would they do with it? Yes. And suddenly, you know, then you're able to think about, yeah, sort of get out of the box and think about how a great company like Apple. It sounds like you've, you've tapped into, you know, ability of people just to think outside the box and really, you know, brainstorm what in the world we could be. Well, we feel like we're on the journey. Uh, I can't tell you we feel like we've self-actualized, but one of the gifts that I always remember from what Steve Jobs talked about, and we still have work to do to get here, is I once heard him interviewed, and they asked him what his favorite product was at Apple, and they listed all the amazing products that we could all list right now. And he paused, and he said, it's actually all the products we chose not to build, because that allowed us to put our love and our care and our design into the products we did build. And so it's about being really focused and minimalist as opposed to doing lots and lots of things. And we still have a little bit of the shiny bumper syndrome. Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you get good creative people and you have a lot of experimentation. And it's my job and our leader's job to continue to narrow and focus so the company puts its greatest work into the most important things. Yeah. Now, you served, I think, past tense on the board of Yahoo. Yes, I did. Um, I, I'm interested, it's a very different company from Intuit. I've just, you know, what was, what was the experience sort of seeing that company, which has its own, you know, challenges and good mm -hmm. and bad things going on. You know, what, what, what was that experience like and how do you, how do you sort of take what you learned there to, back to Intuit? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I love Yahoo. It's an iconic company. Everyone in the Valley is very proud of Yahoo. Um, I was serving in a period where there was a lot of change going on. There were five CEOs, um, three permanent, two interim at the time. We found Marissa. Um, there were changes in the board that were going on. But I could tell you when I step back, I have nothing but delight and pride that I had the chance to be a part of that whole process. I can tell you the thing that it reminded me of at the end. We are mission-driven companies. And during that period of time with all the leadership transition, Yahoo got a little bit confused. In fact, the question in the hallway is, are we a technology company or a media company? And quite candidly, those are the wrong questions because those are both hows. Technology is in service to something and a media company is a monetization model. What is it that you want to do in somebody's life that changes the world in a way your company will be remembered? And that's what Marissa has brought back to the company, is how do I embed myself into your everyday life and let you do magical things that you could have never imagined doing? And that's why now the talent is flowing back into Yahoo. They've got great products coming out. I know there's a transition they'll work through, but I think it's always important to remind yourself that you serve the purpose of what the customers want you to do. It's not about whether it's a pencil or technology, and it is not about whether it's an advertising model or a subscription model. It's about what is your mission. Mm -hmm. You had said before that I, th I think the way you rank it, you put, you put your uh, employees first, your customers second, your shareholders yes. third. Yes. Do, you, do some CEOs challenge that and say, Sure, that sounds great, but you've, you've got to put shareholders first. It's your fiduciary duty to put shareholders first. Yes. It's how you keep your job. It's how you yeah. get remunerated. I mean, you know, do, do you actually have kickback on that? All the time. In fact, there is a rigorous debate. I'm a part of a roundtable, the CEO roundtable, that gets together once a quarter in the Valley, and it's the companies you might imagine. And, and there are some that say, we are so customer-centric, customers come first. And then there are others that say, look, we're public companies. We have to recognize we work for the shareholders. They own the company, and shareholders come first. And of course, there's some of us that say employees. The way I boil it down is as a public company, imagine you're a human body. Employees are the air. You can make it three minutes without employees, but then you're pretty much in trouble. The customers are water. You can make it three days without customers, but then you're in trouble. And then the shareholders are food. You can make it about three weeks without shareholders, and then you're in trouble. If you don't have all three delighted, you're in trouble at some point. But you can't do anything. When I say, if you see a customer problem you want to solve and you don't have employees, it's just an aspiration. You're not doing anything. You have to have employees that are fired up and talented and excited about changing that customer's life. So that's why I fundamentally believe, and the sales to service profit chain would back that up many years ago, which is it really starts with delighted employees doing awesome things for customers that will change the shareholder's life. We, you know, Harvard Business Review writes you know, endlessly about sort of the problem of short-term versus long-term thinking and the yes. way... You know, CEOs and other executives um, are incentivized, you know, supposedly makes them focus so much on the short term, perhaps the long term detriment of the company or certain, certainly to the detriment of, of R&D and, you know, innovative thinking inside companies. Um, I guess I'm curious from your perch, do you agree with that? And if whatever you feel, you know, and if you do, is there a, is there a solution to that? Is there an approach that, that, that we as a society or that companies individually should be taking? I do agree that pressure's there. 
I also agree that it's the number one thing as a leader that you have to fight against. You have to rage against that machine because otherwise you're going to have a very successful short period of time and then you're going to have a trouble after that because the world's just changing too quickly. You've got to always be thinking about the horizon. There's two things. One is we just talked about employees, customers, and shareholders. At Intuit, we call that true north. But over top of those three stakeholders, we have a tagline that says, deliver the best results we can in the current period for these three stakeholders while building the foundation for a stronger future. And so it's about short and long. The how we use is Jeffrey Moore wrote a book called Horizon Planning, Horizon Management. And what we do here is Google's often referred to it as 60-30-10. We have a 70-20-10. But what we basically say is, what are the products today that have made us the mainstay in a customer's life, TurboTax, Quick, and QuickBooks. And what are you going to do to measure the success of those products? It's also it's like market share, revenue, and profitability. But what are you going to do to continue to make them better tomorrow? And you put resources in there, in our case, 70%. The next 20% are the adolescent products. Their products have already been proven. They're growing really, really quickly. And you want to fund them for growth. You don't expect them to be profitable, but you do expect them to get more profitable with every unit they sell. You've got to prove scale. And we put 20% of our resources there. The last 10% is unstructured time. These are the experiments. What are the ideas that could produce tomorrow's big oak trees? The one rule of thumb is general managers and business leaders have to have the resources allocated, and you're never allowed to borrow from one bucket for the other. So if you run into trouble in the short, you've got to reallocate your 70%. You cannot go borrow from Horizon 2 or Horizon 3, because otherwise you're stealing from tomorrow to take care of today. That discipline sounds easy. It is incredibly hard, but if you do it, it produces a steady pipeline of new ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is related, but, but you, know, you also talk about trying to run the company like it's a startup. Yes. You know, perpetually act like it's a startup. What do you mean by that, and, what, and what's, what can, you, you know, can you really do that? Is it possible to do? We believe you can. Uh, it really comes down to two concepts, experimentation, so it's meritocracy of the best ideas, and then the second one is teams no bigger than two pizzas can feed that can self-form based upon their passion and allow them to be autonomous and fast-moving. And so the experimentation we talk about is Eric Ries and the Lean Startup model. We've adopted that with the hypothesis and the rapid experiments. Um, and it's very, very important to allow employees to be able to get the best ideas on the table because they're going to come up with something you didn't think about. So that's really what a startup does. It's always about pivot. What Eric Ries teaches, it's not about the burn rate on cash flow. It's about the burn rate and cycle time on new ideas and learning. How do you accelerate your learning in the shortest period of time? Uh, and then the second one is the ability for small teams to move fast. And what you have to do there is you've got to push the decision making down to the front lines. Be very, very clear that they have the empowerment to start and stop the experiment based upon whether they actually prove success or not. And then the second thing you have to realize is your job as a leader is to remove barriers. And so those are the two things we really work on in the company. And you, you actually brought Eric Reese into the company, is that right? We did, yes. And t talk about that a little bit. I mean, I mean, you know, what kind of engagement and... and well, he's worked with us for several years now. Um, he came on early on because when he originally was doing the concept, he said he thought about it more in a startup mode. But when we had the chance to see his manuscript in its early draft, we said, you just described our company. And by the way, you described every company. These are people coming together and trying to achieve amazing things with you know, limited resources. So I don't care if it's a startup or not. Every company struggles with that. And so we immediately began to adopt his principles and practice. And he was surprised to see that it worked just as well in an established 30-year-old company as it did in a startup. And we began to collaborate. So he comes in and coaches our teams. We have a product team come in and sit with him, and they'll present their idea and their prototype to him. He'll ask him, what's the next thing you have to prove, your next leap of faith assumption? They'll describe it to him, and he'll say, okay, how are you going to test it? And they'll say, well, I'm going to run a survey, or I'm going to do a little survey monkey, and I'm going to come back in two weeks. And he says, how are you going to get me uh, results in the next 24 hours? He's always condensing the cycle time of learning. And what you find is the rougher the prototype, the better the result. Mm -hmm. Can I tell a story on this one? Yeah, please. Coming out of college, I worked for Pepsi. Started out riding with the route salesmen, the drivers who delivered soft drinks. I was in Michigan. I was riding with one of the award-winning sales drivers, and we, it was at Halloween time, and we were building Halloween um, displays in all the big supermarkets using 12-pack cans of Pepsi. And there was a contest, and you got to win a trip to Club Med if you won. So I was 22, and I wanted to go to Club Med. <laughs> So we're building out this haunted house in this huge Kroger store, and it looked awesome. And just when we were ready to leave the store, the route salesman took three cases off of the display and put them back on his dolly to wheel them in the back room. And it left this hole. 
And I went up and I started to fill it back up because I thought, man, we're going to lose the contest. And he said, son, you don't understand. If this doesn't have what we call a starter gap, a shopping gap in it, the consumers will walk by and no one will want to actually mess up the display. We're here to sell product. The contest <laughs> is just a side thing. <laughs> And so what you learn is in software, if you give someone this perfectly finished product and ask them for feedback, no one wants to hurt your feelings. But if you give it to it taped up and mocked up and handwritten, boy, they'll grab a pen and start drawing immediately. And what happens in that process is they end up owning the outcome. It becomes their product. So the rougher the prototype, the better feedback you're going to get. How, how was Club Med? Club Med was awesome. I think I <laughs> went to Martinique. It was beautiful. So, so you've talked mostly about, about how, you know, how to generate ideas from your team, how to empower them to sort of yes. solve problems. But, but I think you've also written that you're quite open to you know, taking good ideas from your competitors. We are. And can you talk a little bit about, about that and who you admire, who's you know, broad, broadly defined as in your space? And yeah, I sure can. You know, I, one of my favorite quotes is it used to be called plagiarism. Now it's called benchmarking. And if you really step back, you can be inspired by everyone, including competition. And one of the things that I'll tell you is competitors keep you on your toes. And we tell our teams, I know I'm full of all these little cliches today, but you don't, you don't blow on someone else's candle to make your own glow brighter. And so we ask our teams to come in in each review and tell me about a competitor that I've never heard of and tell me three things about what they're doing that you admire, that you're going to adopt or at least test tomorrow. Because it's very easy to come in and say, we're bigger, we're more re resourced, we've got bigger market share. But if you ask them to go look for the surprise, you're really surprised. I mean, you'll say, wow, they're doing amazing things. Two great examples, um, Jack Dorsey and Square did a wonderful job of reimagining payments and democratizing payments for the small businesses that we, quite frankly, were over-serving. And they found a way to actually get a payments capability into the hands of someone that goes to a weekend craft show. But then the rest of the week, they choose to be working someplace else or they're a stay-at-home mom or dad. And that was really an overserved segment and quite missed. And so he did a wonderful job of reimagining the market. Another one is Zen Payroll. Zen Payroll is a company out in the West Coast. And they said most of us, including our company, think about payroll as a task that is required but not desired. How am I going to get my employees paid so I can get back to doing what I want to do and make sure I don't get in trouble with the government in the process? They said, no, imagine this. The number one thing an employee wants to know is that their employer is proud of them. And the number one way you can do that is by giving them some money. So they turned the paycheck into a celebration. They put little attaboys on everyone's pay stub, even if it's electronic. It says, you rock, you were fantastic. And so the manager actually can put these little statements in there. And if you read their product, it's very whimsical. And quite frankly, they're reimagining payroll. We quickly adopted that. We benchmarked it. And now we're using that in our payroll yeah. product. <laughs> It's an homage, really. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the best compliment I can give them. <laughs> All right. So now, so, so you know, Intuit is, uh, is not actually a startup. You've got, you're up to 8,000 employees. Yeah. You've reinvented a couple times and, and seem like you've reinvented effectively for what the market requires now, what technology uh, uh, requires now. So, so what's next? How, you know, where do you go from here? Well, we're constantly reimagining. Uh, one of the things we have to do is stay focused on the horizon and look at what the next chapter is going to be, what customers need, and how it's going to be delivered. Right now, the two most important things we're trying to focus on are the importance of upstream input metrics. Companies can get fixated on things like revenue and profit, and then if they're really good, they back up and they talk about funnel conversion, traffic and conversion into trial and trial into sales. If they're even better, they'll step back and say, hey, I can predict conversion by whether or not it's they, they loaded in their bank account information by the second login. But what you really have to get all the way back to is what was the customer hiring the product to do? I wish I could do this in half the time. I wish I could do this and get a bigger, a bigger refund instead of having to pay money. And then really start to measure that. And that's measuring the customer benefit. And that's one of the areas that no matter what happens from a technology perspective, we have to get better at. So we're spending time next week with our top 400 leaders focused again on all the way back to nailing the customer benefit, which is the base of the delight pyramid. The second is there's a great quote in the Silicon Valley, the reason why God um, was able to create heaven and earth in seven days is he did not have legacy technology and an install base of customers to worry about. 
with all due respect to that, I'm sure whoever the deities are that you may believe in, they could have done that, but you got the point. Um, there's companies today that everyone views, well, the next player coming in has got a fresh start, but the, the platforms are changing so fast, you have to have the ability to adapt and continuously evolve. We were born in the era of DOS, and everyone thought Windows would put us out, and then we made it through Windows, and then the World Wide Web and sock puppets on the Super Bowl were going to destroy us. And we made it to the web, and then the mobile phone came. And now we're in the era of big data and cloud, but the piece we have to now work on is taking all of our technology and turn it into small services that teams can literally pick up and write to and move fast. And Amazon has nailed that. So we've been studying Amazon for 18 months. Mm -hmm. Long answer to a short question, yeah. customer benefits and technology written as services. Yeah. So I want to open up to, to questions in a second, but I guess maybe the last thing I'll ask you directly is, so given you know, the way you've changed and the way you've empowered uh, uh, consumers, and what is the role of the CEO, you know, what, what, and how has it changed? What do you do, what do you not do then in this position? Okay, well, I had the chance last night to see Mr. Buffett speak at a conference, and he didn't use this particular quote, but I heard this years ago. I'm going to paraphrase because I can never get him perfect, but he's so amazing. He once said that you should invest in companies with business models and sources of competitive advantage are so durable that a monkey could someday run the company. Because if you wait long enough, a monkey will. My company's been proving that for seven years, right. and so far we're hanging in there. <laughs> but I can tell you, the role of a CEO, my perspective is very simple. It's three things. Be clear about the grand challenge, the vision, the mission, the things we talked about when we talked about Yahoo. The second is create the environment for experimentation, where it's a meritocracy of ideas. No PowerPoint, politics, or persuasion. It is absolutely the best idea wins. And the third is make sure your job is to remove barriers from people who have great ideas. And that is my job, and that's where I spend all my energy and time. And the best ideas that emerge often are somebody else's work, and I get the opportunity to create the environment so it can actually see the light of day. And are you basically doing strategy? I do strategy, time? yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm involved in product reviews. I spend, in my 100 points, 40% of my time is actually in product reviews. That's one of the things we learned from shadowing those 17 companies. I spend time reviewing products, coaching teams, removing barriers, making sure they have resources. 30% of my time is spent growing and developing our talent. I do town halls and chats. I meet one-on-one -on -one with employees, make sure that I'm speaking to the teams and they understand the frameworks. 20% of my time is outside the company, seeking the inspiration from Zen Payroll and Square and my peers in the Valley. And then 10% of my time is unstructured too, which is usually between midnight and six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so Angela, I'm guessing that you've got questions sure. coming in from yep. uh, the online audience. So you want to? Yeah, we have a lot of great questions. So great. Look, look, you have really described the way that you've made into it an a innovation machine. So I want to ask, can you talk a little bit about how you think about acquisitions and partnering? Yes, I sure can. Uh, first of all, I think one of the hardest things you have to wrestle with when you're in a company that is very proud of its ability to create and innovate is that great ideas can come from everywhere. And it is not a failure of a company to recognize someone has come up with something that will accelerate your own progress. And the way we often do that is we point to some of the great acquisitions from some of the greatest companies that our engineers admire. So you can look at Apple and they bought Beats. You can look at Google and their acquisition of YouTube and Facebook. I mean, you can name all these companies that our engineers say, wow, they're great, and you realize that they make acquisitions. And what acquisitions do is they should already take your strategy into context, but they really acceler accelerate your technology or your talent so that you get there much faster. And so for us, we're actually a company that's happened through a lot of acquisitions. Scott founded the company with Quicken. We saw a company called Shipsoft, which we renamed TurboTax, and we acquired it. And through the years, we've made those acquisitions, and then what we are are basically 8,000 entrepreneurs that create an environment where we continue to innovate together. So it is critical to recognize that innovation happens everywhere. I think Procter & Gamble, A.G. Lafley, calls it connect and develop. But you have to embrace the innovation no matter where it is and then find a way to harness it in your company. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to take questions from, from people who are here in the audience. So um, put your hand up. and Yep, and I think we have a microphone. Hang on one second. So you said you had approximately 8,000 entrepreneurs. Yes. Um, in that vein, when one of your groups comes up with something that ends up taking hold, is that product or service then owned by Intuit, or is there some sort of program in place where there's a shared ownership of the, the product or service? Well, it is literally owned by Intuit. 
but it is figuratively owned by the person who created the product. So years ago, we began to wrestle with, with this unstructured time, where we are going to create a bunch of startups that eventually would want to go out and take the idea and say, look, I'm going to go do this on my own. I could become a gazillionaire. So we began to interview our best innovators inside the company, and we said, what is it that you wished you would get if you came up with an idea that changed the company's trajectory and changed a customer's life? And they said, time to work on it. We said, really? What about financials? And they said, well, that's really, it's interesting, but we actually want to see this come to fruition. We build stuff because we want it to change a customer's life. So we introduced something called the Scott Cook Innovation Awards. And what happens is every year, out of all these unstructured time experiments, we'll put many into market, and there's about a half a dozen that get nominated and selected, and then Scott and I will sit down and we'll make the final decision on who wins. The winners of those awards get their choice. They get three months off 100% of the time, 100% off for three months, to work on that project or any other project in the company they're interested in, or six months at 50% off. And then what we have done, without ever announcing it, we did a look back at some of the best ideas that came out, and there was a gentleman who actually launched a payments business that's now it's a multi-hundred million dollar business for us. He just wanted the time, and we gave that to him, but we awarded him a million dollars, a Founders Award. And so now that's in the system as, wow, if I come up with the next thing, that could be mine too. And so it really is, though, about when you sit and talk to the teams, they say, I actually want to have the ability to work on something that matters. I want to see it make it to market, and the management team give it the resources it needs, and that's all I'm looking for. And so that's, that's the way we've been able to manage it so far, and it's worked. Given, just to follow up, given how much you are you know, relying on your employees to come up with, with game-changing ideas, has that changed how you hire I mean, are you looking for a different skill set now when you bring people into the company? Oh, we absolutely do. Yeah, we are looking for the entrepreneurial spirit. We're looking for someone who wants to create. In our HR department, their customers that they follow home are the employees. And they have to reimagine what's the hiring process, what's the, the performance management process, and they literally do net promoter scores on that. And they try to reimagine how we're going to do it. So everyone has to have the startup entrepreneurial spirit. And they have to be scrappy. They've got to be willing to deal with less resource and come up with innovative ways to make it happen. And that has changed our pipeline of who we hire. Mm -hmm. So you're competing with everybody who we, works. Absolutely. That's, yeah. The war on talent is the best war of all. Yeah. It's fun. Uh, Anna? Yeah, go, following up on the question of usability, someone asked, um, do you make it a point to target specific age groups or technical aptitudes? And how do you ensure that you're not leaving demographics behind when you're designing a product that you have to apply to so many different um, customer bases? Yeah, this is a really good question that is also one that we don't have perfectly nailed yet. And a great example is this year in tax season. So the, the important thing is we build typically horizontal products. And then from there, based upon the individual with data, you're now able to build a responsive experience. So if we come in and we recognize when you enter the data in TurboTax, for example, that you're a college student, we can look at all the other people who are in that same demographic and look at the kinds of questions that they needed to answer to get their taxes done, and we can eliminate all the other questions, and we literally design the experience for you. We can even change the tone in the product to be more reflective of that group. So with big data now, you're able to do this. You can literally use social to say, how am I going to build this experience to be just for you? The example where we didn't get it right is we have 80% of our tax customers in TurboTax now filing in the cloud. We have 20% still filing with a PC using a Windows-based product or a Mac product. Last year, we had made this responsive experience happen in the cloud, and this year we wanted to bring that magic back to our desktop customers. I have received thousands upon thousands of letters that begin with, I've been using this product for 20 years, and now it's different and I don't want different. And so we made the leap of faith that, wow, we're going to bring all this future magic to these customers, and we didn't take enough time to sit with them and say, what do you want? What's important? I've done a YouTube a video, a LinkedIn video, apologizing, falling on my sword, and said, we messed up, um, and we've earned our way into this, and we'll earn our way out. We've given those customers rebates, and we've told them that we won't make that mistake again. The only promise I can make them is uh, we will make more mistakes, but it won't be that one. We'll go make new ones. Yeah. That idea of um, supporting something which the company is, is not putting resources into is a classic challenge, is how do you keep a conservative, older demographic happy when you've got all this gen general interest and energy in the staff to leap into the cloud and to go at the leading edge of technology. 
So how do you handle that balance of resourcing that? Well, it comes back to that horizon management that I mentioned. The same thing happens with our technology platforms. Right now, there's this huge shift where people are trying to move off of the desktop and into the cloud and mobile. And many of my peer companies have made decisions where they're going to sunset their desktop products. They're literally announcing that in 2016, 2017, we'll no longer produce CDs. You can't buy PCs now that actually come with a, you know, a CD insert. And if you go to the retail stores like Best Buy, the retail shelf space for software for computers is 50% less than it was five years ago. But there's a reality, and the reality is there's going to be a core group of customers who are going to use that methodology because they don't trust the cloud or they have a reason to believe this is a better solution. And so you have to make a choice. And we've made it a so choice, even from the days of DOS, that we will not force a software delivery model on a customer. We won't allocate 100% of our resources to that product, but we will keep those customers delighted, and we'll make sure that the version of that product we have in the market is better than any other alternative. So we call it leave no desktop customer behind. But in a 100-point exercise, if it's 20% of the customers, it will have a lesser percent of our resource. But the key here is to keep them delighted and don't assume that what these people like, they like. And that's the mistake we made this year. But it really comes down to trade-offs. Um, and the worst mistake we can make is assuming that what the magic is over here is going to work for them. <clears throat> Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah. Our equivalent is, is leave no print reader behind. I mean, right. you know, yeah. it, 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 it's generational maybe mostly, or, or, but not always. It's a, just a preference, and so we have to Very you much. Know, hit it out of the park with, with every platform that we're involved in. Absolutely. It's well said. Um, yeah, right here. Yeah, you talked about your peers in the Valley. Uh, I'd like to have your perspective on the international uh, perspective uh, as a market, as a source of ideas, as a source of competencies. How do you look at the international arena? With tremendous interest and envy. Uh, we have historically been a company that was focused in the U.S. Um, our tax system, TurboTax, was based on the U.S. tax system. And despite how excited we are about it, no other country has been unwise enough to export our tax system to their country. <laughs> so our product wasn't going to work elsewhere. Um, but we did start to notice more universal needs, like small businesses dealing with money in and money out, which we call accounting. But ours is based upon GAAP and non-GAAP, and outside the U.S., it's IFRS. And so we've started an exploratory journey in 2008 to say, how do we become a global connected services company? Because when things go into the cloud, the borders come down. No matter what happened, if we built the products in the U.S. and we put it up on TurboTax.com, 20% of our calls started coming from outside the U.S. wanting to use the product. So we have been on a journey. We're now in six countries. But one of the things we've been doing is we've been going in and we've been learning from those in the market. And in particular, those that are coming in on the new platforms. Because many of the incumbents, we know how that chapter plays out because we've had to make that journey. So there are a lot of new competitors that we're inspired by. Um, some of them we invite to be a part of the family. And some of those we know we're going to have to compete with. And we simply go to school and we try our best to do something better and different than they do. But I will tell you, it's a, it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to learn from those that are skipping past what we did in the States. And I know you know this, but you know we went through the PCs, and then we've gone to the mobile devices. And you go to the emerging economies, and their first computer is their mobile phone. And they don't have any of the tendencies of sitting down. We call it never enter data twice. You know, We type it in, and then it's in the cloud. They're in a model of never enter data at all which is they just turn it on and they expect it to be there, pulled down from their social graph and everything else. So it causes you to reimagine your business. And by the way, if you do it well there, you can bring that magic back here. And that's what we're really excited about in Global. I lived for about 10 years in Hong Kong. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, the, the, one of the great things about Hong Kong is the simplicity of tax filing. Yes. And you know, in this country, if you're for a flat tax, you're sort of a, you know, slightly mm -hmm. kooky or you know, way to the extreme. I became a convert. I mean, honestly, I, it might put you guys out of business, but yep. you, know, it, it, you, you spend about two minutes doing your taxes. There's a flat rate. It's not progressive. There's that issue. But if you're under a certain you know, minimum, you're not paying any taxes. There are no deductions, but people still do charitable giving. I mean, it, 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 it seems to work, minimal amounts of, of tax avoidancy, and it's just fill out a form in about two minutes, and you're done. I'll tell you, Adi, we are huge proponents of tax simplification. We don't choose the how. We don't write policies. So whether it's flat tax or it's three levels or anything else, it doesn't matter. But we've spent 30 years trying to simplify the tax code. In fact, our mission for our tax business is taxes are done. In the United States, people spend six billion hours a year in front of a CPA or a tax professional or in front of a computer getting their taxes done. 
Why would they spend six billion hours a year? Because 70% of them are going to get the biggest paycheck of their year, and that's going to send their kid to school or be able to buy the clothes. And so our goal is we're trying to get all the data from your employer, from your bank, 1099 ints and divs, and download it in so when you log in, it's just like what you experience in Hong Kong, your taxes are done. You simply review it, hit send, and they're done. That's our vision. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, somebody here asked, um, why don't you partner with the federal government? And um, if you can't get the feds to partner with you, how do you think of, uh, of uh, partners? When you go out to look at other companies, how do you pick a good partner? Yeah, so we do work with the federal government today. Uh, we have worked with them on lots of things. We began a program in 98 at Intuit as a part of our charitable program. One of our values is we care and give back which is with the privilege of success comes the opportunity to give back. And we began to donate tax software to people below a certain income who needed to fulfill their obligation but couldn't afford the software. It was called the Intuit Tax Freedom Project. The government adopted it and became the Free File Alliance in 2002, 2003. And now all of our peers, we offer it for free. You can't cross-sell a customer. You can't try to upsell them. You're not allowed to market to them. And we put our software in this website, and the government does the marketing. And so we work with them that way. Um, about 15 years ago, the government wanted to move out of paper into electronic filing to reduce all that manual process and get people's refunds faster. And so we were the early ones to create an e-file capability, and now the industry has done it, and now 90% of all the government's tax returns are electronically filed. So there is a collaboration. It has to be a win-win. You have to keep your white hat on, and you have to realize that we're not adversaries. We may not always agree with the how but we ultimately can agree on the what. And if we work together, we can make it happen. What makes a great partner uh, is someone who's willing to, when you find someone who has the same objective you do, and it is a high enough priority for them and a high enough priority for you that you're going to put your best people on it, and you're going to make it something that you're going to spend time reviewing. There are way too many press release partnerships that read great in a press release that do absolutely nothing in the market. And the reason why is because they're all sizzle and no steak. So if we don't actually get together and prove that this is big enough for me to spend time and perhaps my peer on the other side, you're not going to make the impact you want to have. Mm -hmm. uh, we have time for a few more questions. I've got one great one from the Good. web that somebody asked. You know, Brad, um, you run a technology company. Well, it's a t company that relies on a lot of technology, but you don't really have a technology background, do you? And does that actually help you in your job? And maybe talk a little bit about what you did before you came to, into it. Yeah, well, first of all, I, uh, I love technologists, and I know that I'm not a technologist, but our company defines itself as a customer-focused, design-driven technology company. Technology is the how, but it begins with the customer. And I began my career in packaged goods where you needed to understand the customer. And then from there, I went into direct mail marketing where you had to truly understand the customer. And then from there, I was in a payroll processing company where we spent a lot of time understanding the customer. And then at 80, and into it for 10 years, I've been studying the customer with follow me homes every year. So if you really understand the customer, technology is a key asset, but you don't have to be able to write code. The other thing I've learned, and this has been a hard lesson, is I fundamentally believe leadership is not about the answers you have, it's about the questions you ask. And what a technology company really wants is someone asking the right questions and creating the space for them to create magic. And so in my world, if the engineers feel like I'm celebrating their work and creating the space for them to do their best work, that's going to create great products. And I don't have to be able to write the code. In fact, if I'm writing the code, my fear is I'll get into giving the answers. And right now, I know what I don't know. And so I'm not about to tell someone how to write code. I'm simply going to ask the question. Boy, they've got a clean slate. They can write anything they want at that point. This is why I don't write code. Also because I don't know how to write code. Right. Yeah. I don't know how to write code. Yeah. Uh, we have time for probably one more question. Yeah, in the back. Hi, yes. If you look at um, Simon Sinek's Golden Circle, how would you speak to the why of Intuit? Okay, you're going to have to uh, forgive my ignorance. I went to Marshall University, so the golden circle is... It's, so you start with the what, yep. and then the how, and then really at the core of it, it's the why. Yes. So how do you drive the why, and how do you define that internally? I got it. Um, for us, our why began 30 years ago at a small kitchen table <laughs> when our founder, Scott Cook, observed his wife, Signe, struggle to balance the family checkbook. And his version of the story is he knew that she was the smartest one in the house. And if she was struggling with this, imagine what everyone else is struggling with. And so our why is to improve customers' financial lives so profoundly 
They could have never imagined going back to the old way of doing things. If you translate that into practical terms, our mission for 30 years has been to eliminate poverty, to help people economically take a step forward from where they have been so the next generation is stronger than the prior, and to help small businesses thrive and survive. One out of two fell in the first five years and two out of three in the first 10, and our goal is to increase those odds of success. So our why is to improve our customers' financial lives, and that gets people really pumped up and fired up because while we may not be making video games, we're changing people's lives, and there isn't a person that comes to work who doesn't have a cousin, an aunt, a relative, or a friend who they know is struggling to try to figure out how to pay for college or to try to get their kids in school, and that is a cause worth fighting for. All right, on that happy note, I, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, I want to thank uh, Brad Smith for a uh, really great, great presentation, great discussion. I want to thank everybody who's here, everybody who's watching us online. I want to thank Steelcase uh, Work Life Space here in snowy New York City for giving us the space. And uh, everybody have a great day. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.